to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The psalmist said, My sins have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me to bear. Psalm 38, verse 4. We welcome you today to our study of man's sin and God's forgiveness. This is a topic that is especially relevant for every person who's of an accountable age and wants to please God. And so we encourage you to get your Bible and stay tuned as we're going to study this very important subject together. From the Garden of Eden to the present time, man has had to deal with the sin problem, but thankfully, God has made a way of salvation. You see, it's sin that from that time in the garden that has plagued man as a result of his choices. The Bible teaches in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 that when Adam and Eve chose to eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they became separated from God. They felt the burden and the sting of sin. You remember in that context, they hid themselves from God and were ashamed because of their own sin. And friend, that's something that every person of an accountable age has to deal with today. I have to deal with the sin problem. If you're of the accountable age, you have to deal with the sin problem as well. It plagues mankind. Romans 3 verse 23 teaches us the universal nature of sin. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How many? All. The soul who sins shall surely die. Ezekiel 18, 4 and Romans 3, verse 23. Isaiah tells us about the, the horrendous consequences of our sin. Isaiah said in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, that the Lord's ear is not heavy. God doesn't have a hearing problem that He can't hear. Lord's arm's not shortened that He can't save. God doesn't have a defect in His arm. He's not crippled in His arm. And God doesn't need a hearing aid. What's the problem then? Lord's ear's not heavy that He cannot hear. His arm's not shortened that He cannot save. But your sins and your iniquities, my sins and my iniquities, have separated us from our God. Sin has plagued mankind because of the consequences of being separated from Almighty God. And friend, as we think about the nature of sin, as we think about the consequences of it, let's realize that even the most righteous have to deal with the sin problem. Notice this verse, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20, In the long ago, the wise Solomon said, There's not a righteous man on the face of the earth who does good and does not sin. Even righteous people, from time to time, those who are trying to live right, those who are trying to walk in the light, 1 John 1 verse 7, we make mistakes. We break God's laws and we feel the, the, the sting and the plague of sin. And friend, are you remembering Romans 6, 23, where the Bible says, The wages of sin is death. This is a problem that's relevant for every person today. But thank God, thankfully, God has made a way of salvation so that we can be delivered and saved from sin. I'm reminded of the beautiful words of 1 Peter 2, 24. The cure, the antidote, the, the remedy to sin is given when the Bible says of Jesus, He Himself, Christ Himself, bore our sins in His own body upon the tree that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. God made the remedy to sin through His Son, Jesus Christ, and thank God that Christ went to the cross to deal with the sin problem. You see, it is said of Jesus in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that God made Christ, who knew no sin, 
to be sin on our behalf that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours alone, but for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2. I remind you of the text where the Lord instituted His Supper. In Matthew chapter 26, as He told His disciples to drink of that fruit of the vine, He said in verse number 28, This is My blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus tasted death. For every man, Hebrews 2 verse 9, so that I don't have to. And so yes, man has to deal with the, the sin problem, but God has made a remedy and a cure for that through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And friend, as Christians, we need to realize God's plan and God's way is the only way to be saved. Now, as we think about man's sin and God's forgiveness, I want you to see today, and I want every one of us to understand that the God of the Bible is a loving, kind, and forgiving God, and that He wants every man to be saved from sin. Let's notice this. Our God, the God of the Bible, is a forgiving God who loves you and who wants you to be forgiven of sin and saved. You know, sometimes people present the idea of God, and there's no doubt God gets angry at sin, but sometimes the idea of God is that He's seen as angry and vengeful and full of wrath and just ready to destroy man for his sin. And while it's the case that God will punish sinners, friend, let's realize the God of the Bible is a forgiving God who is seen as ready to forgive sin. I want you to notice this passage with me. In Psalm chapter 86, here's the, here's the heart of God. Here's how God really feels about sin. The psalmist says in Psalm 86 verse 5, For you, Lord, are good. Notice this and ready to forgive, and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. What's the heart of God as it relates to sin? Listen to these words. The God of the Bible is good. What do you mean? He's ready to forgive. God stands ready. He stands waiting is the idea. His desire, His want, His longing is to forgive man of sin based on the plan that He's made. The psalmist said in Psalm 103, verses 10 through 12, As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. If we got what we deserved, we'd all be lost in sin, but God is making that way, and He wants to remove sins from us. Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4 are some of my favorite verses that show the, the readiness, the willingness of the God of the Bible to forgive sin. The psalmist asked this question, If you, O Lord, were to mark iniquities, who could stand? Think about it this way. If every time I sinned and every time you sinned, God made a mark. He kept a mark. He kept a record. He wrote it down. He penciled in a book. On the day of judgment, if that was God's mindset, who could stand? Well, nobody. We'd all be guilty multiple times and deserve the punishment we've incurred. Listen to verse 4. But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. What's God's thinking and mindset about forgiving man? God's ready to forgive. But friend, let's also notice this from the Scripture. Not only is God ready to forgive, the God of the Bible wants to forget our sins. He wants to put sin in the past where it can't hurt man and cannot affect their relationship with God. There's a passage that I would direct your attention to in the book of Hebrews which so clearly shows that God is indeed wanting and willing to forget our sins. Listen to Hebrews chapter 8. Verse number 12. This is a quote from the Old Testament in Jeremiah 31 verse 34. And the Hebrew writer applies that to forgiveness in the new covenant. Hebrews 8 verse 12. God says, For I will be merciful to their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. 
Now, friend, it's not as though God can't remember. It's not as though the memory of God has been erased. But God, when we obey the gospel, when people submit to God's plan of salvation, when one accesses the saving blood of Jesus, God chooses to forget, to not hold that against them. And oh, how wonderful of an idea that is about God. Isaiah 1 verse 18, God said, Though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they shall be as wool. From red and stained and full of sin to forgiven and clean and white. That's the picture that God paints of His forgiveness and His willingness to forget our sin. You know, aren't we thankful that when we mess up, people are willing to forgive and forget? Maybe you've said something to someone that hurt them. Maybe you've done something to someone that was mean or unkind or that you even know you shouldn't have done. Aren't you glad when people forgive and forget about that and let that go and don't hold it against you? Friend, there's the picture of God and His forgiveness in the Bible. But you know, a third quality about God as a forgiving God is that our God is also long-suffering. God's patient. God's long-suffering. He is willing to uh, wait with man, to give him time, and to be patient with man. And that's a clear picture of God that you see in the Bible. Listen to this beautiful verse. 2 Peter 3 verse 9, the Bible says this. Concerning God's coming, and some are Christ's coming, and some are wondering, why is that taking so long? Why hasn't the Lord come yet? The Lord's not slow concerning His promises, as some count slowness. What's the, what's the holdup then? But He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Aren't you glad God's long-suffering? You know, when we talk about the forgiveness of God, we're talking about the character of being long-suffering. He's patient, He's willing to forgive man, and He gives man time and opportunity to make that right with Him. And friend, how clear it is in the Bible that the plan of God the scheme of redemption, salvation that is available in Christ demonstrates so beautifully how God wants to forgive man. Yet while we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone might dare to die. Now listen to this. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How forgiving is our God? So much so that Romans 5 verses 6 through 8 says, God made a plan, that plan's available, and it is a clear demonstration of God's love for me and you. Let's make it as crystal clear as we can. How much does God want to forgive me and you? God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Friend, does that not illustrate in some of the most beautiful uh, language and beautiful ideas how much God is a forgiving and loving God? You know, you can see the examples of that, of God's forgiveness in both the Old and the New Testament. For example, won't you think with me to one of the great kings of the Bible, likely the greatest under the Old Testament, King David. David is a prime example of God's forgiveness. You remember in 2 Samuel 11 and 12, David had an adulterous relationship with a woman by the name of Bathsheba. 2 Samuel 12, uh, Nathan comes to David and he convicts him of sin. You're the man. He committed adultery. He lied. He eventually had Bathsheba's husband murdered in the battlefield. And then Nathan convicts him of sin. You're the man. And David was ready to be forgiven. He saw the heartbreak of sin. And, and, and from this example, I want you to notice how ready our God was to forgive David. Listen to Psalm 51, and I want you to notice what David says about God's forgiveness. David says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgression, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from sin. 
Maybe you've done things like unto David. Maybe you've done things that aren't that bad or maybe things that are even worse in others' eyes. Friend, know this. If David could be forgiven, we can be forgiven as well. That's the wonder, the beauty, and the splendor of God's forgiveness. Another example, of course, is Adam and Eve. You've got Genesis chapter 3 where they break God's law. They fail to do what God wanted them to do, and as a result, they're cast out of the garden. But even there, a plan was made. Genesis 3 verse 15, the seed of woman is coming. He's going to bring salvation. He's going to bruise the head of Satan, going to bruise the serpent. And an ultimate way was even made for Adam and Eve. Think about people like the Apostle Paul. Paul did some pretty bad things. Acts chapter 6 and 7, he's holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen. Stephen. Acts chapter 8, he's wreaking havoc on the church, dragging men and women to prison. And yet, Paul said later, in the beautiful verse of 1 Timothy 1 verse 15, This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. David, Adam and Eve, the Apostle Paul, and a host of other people could be drawn up from the Bible to show, yes, not only does the Bible say God is a forgiving and loving God, but these examples confirm that I have hope and that you have hope based on these teachings. Now, friend, as we think about the forgiveness of God, let's realize that that forgiveness does indeed come at a high cost. I cannot take sin lightly. I cannot lightly, I cannot have a flippant attitude towards sin and say, you know, God will take care of it. I can sin. It's okay. No. God's willing to forgive. We've seen man sin. We've seen the heart of God in wanting to forgive man. But realize today that that forgiveness comes at a magnitude, at a level, at a cost that we really can't even begin to imagine. It is man's forgiveness that caused Jesus to leave the beauty and splendor of heaven. Think about the words of 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. What do you mean? Though He was rich, yet for your sakes He become poor. Why? That we, through His poverty, might be made rich. Out of the ivory palace, as the psalmist said. And that's the very thing Jesus did. Jesus, the cost of my forgiveness and the cost of your forgiveness demanded a sacrifice, demanded that blood be paid. Hebrews 9, verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And Jesus left the beauty and splendor of heaven. He came and lived as a, a, a pauper, no place to lay his head. And He gave up all that so that I could have the hope and the joy of heaven. Forgiveness also demanded that that sacrifice be perfect. And friend, this meant that Jesus had to live a perfect life for us to have salvation. And how wonderful it is that He did that. Hebrews 4.15 says, He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. God made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. He committed no sin, nor was guile or deceit found in His mouth. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. This is why John would rejoice when he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Can you imagine doing that? Coming to this earth, leaving heaven, coming to this earth, facing every temptation, the devil throwing everything at you that he could, temptation on every hand, and never once sinning. Imagine what Jesus had to do. Imagine what he had to face. Imagine what he had to deal with here. And he lived that perfect life so that we could have the hope of heaven. And then, friend, don't overlook this. Jesus Himself, because of the cost, the high cost of forgiveness, Jesus had to suffer a horrible, horrible death for me and you. Take your mind back, if you would, to Jesus' preparation of His disciples for His upcoming departure. As He instituted the Lord's Supper, He said, This is My blood of the new covenant shed for many 
for the forgiveness of sins. What did the cost of forgiveness demand? The blood of Jesus. The sacrifice of our Lord and Savior because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Jesus, you think about what the Lord went through for me and for you. He, while He was here, people said He was of the devil, that He did these things by Beelzebub. That wasn't true. They laughed at Him. If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. Show you're the Son of God. They mocked Him. They spit in His face. They placed that, that crown of thorns and embedded them into His head. They took Jesus and they scourged His back over and over again with, with whips. They took His hands and feet. They nailed Him to a cross. That cross was embedded in the ground. And Jesus hung in agony and struggled for every breath that He breathed. Why? That's the cost, my friend, of salvation. And do you remember Jesus' words on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46. You know the answer to that? I'm the answer. And you're the answer. He himself bore our sins in his own body upon the tree that we, because of his death and sacrifice, might be forgiven, by whose stripes we are healed. Now, friend, let's shift gears for just a moment then. And as we think about how God's ready to forgive, as we think about how man needs that forgiveness and the high cost of it, we also need to realize today what God has required of man to be forgiven of sin. And friend, the Bible teaches to be forgiven of sin. We've got to be willing to own up to, to recognize, and to come to terms with our sins. Sometimes we use the word, as the Bible does, we need to confess sin. 1 John chapter 1, verses 7-9 through 9 says this, If we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin now, we make God a liar, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all iniquity. What does that word confess mean? When we say confess, what are we talking about? That word confess literally means to lay alongside of. God has a divine record. When I confess sin, I am laying alongside of what God already knows. I'm owning up to, I'm acknowledging, I'm admitting and recognizing I have sinned and I need God. This is why the Bible says, Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. And so to be forgiven of sin, I've got to realize I have sin in my life. I'm going to acknowledge that I need God. I've got to believe Jesus is the only way of salvation. John 8 verse 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. Once I believe Jesus is the Son of God, I also have to be willing to repent of sin. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. I've got to make up my mind that to the best of my ability, I'm going to turn from sin. I'm going to turn from the ways of evil, and I'm going to turn to God and do His will. Acts 3 verse 19, Peter preached, Repent and turn, that your sins may be blotted out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Friend, once I have confessed and realized I do sin, I believe in Jesus, I'm willing to repent of sin, I also have to acknowledge Christ as Lord and Savior. Romans 10 verse 10, with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And then the Bible clearly teaches to get into Christ, to access the soul. It's the blood of Jesus that saves, the death of Jesus that saves. But at what point does man access the blood and the saving death of Jesus? Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into His death? Romans 6, verse 3 and 4. To be forgiven of sin. Friend, the Bible says God's terms for forgiveness is that one must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. And that's not what man says. That's what the Bible says. Listen to Acts 2 verse 38. The very first time salvation was preached in the New Testament, the Bible says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, 
in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of your sins. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Saul of Tarsus was told in Acts 22, 16, Why are you waiting, Saul? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You put all this together and there's no doubt God's ready to forgive. There's no doubt man needs that forgiveness. We must meet God's terms. God's made the plan of salvation available through the death and blood of Jesus, but I've got to access that in obedience to the gospel. Friend, if you've not done that, we beg you today, obey the gospel. I need forgiveness. You need forgiveness. Let's meet God's terms for forgiveness. May God help each of us to do just that. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.